Greetings, folks. Welcome. I think this is a moment that we've all been waiting for. We're actually going to solve a dominant firm and competitive fringe model with some actual numbers, or I'll give you some, some equations that we can actually manipulate to try to find an equilibrium in a dominant firm competitive fringe model. So as a review, in this model, you have a large firm. We call that the dominant firm. It's a price setter in that it faces a downward sloping demand curve, just like a monopolist. And the dominant firm has lower costs than the other firms in the market. And by other firms, we just mean the competitive fringe. The competitive fringe is made up by a bunch of small firms in the market. They are price takers in that they face a horizontal or perfectly elastic demand curve. And they have higher costs than the dominant firm. So as promised, I can give you some information that we can use to find the equilibrium and try to solve the model. So here we have demand as P equals 2000 minus Q. And the fringe supply is given by P equals 1800 plus 4Q. Just sort of as an FYI, these two uh, curves intersect at a quantity of 40 and a price of $1960. So here's what these two curves look like on a graph. Again, you have the, the demand curve. This is the market demand. And you have the supply curve, but it's just the supply for the fringe firms that are in the market. Of course, the dominant firm faces residual demand. That's the demand that's left over after all the competitive firms in the competitive fringe. So if you take the demand, which is P equals 2000 minus Q, you can rearrange that so you have a quantity equals 2,000 minus P. Again, that's just a different way of stating the, the market demand curve. So the fringe supply, again, is given by P equals 1,800 plus 4Q. We can do some rearranging and get a supply of Q equals 0.25P minus 450. Of course, the residual demand is the horizontal difference between the market demand and the supply of all other firms. So here you have it as Q equals 2000 minus P, and that's the market demand, minus 0.25 P minus 450. Again, that's the supply of all other firms. That turns into Q equals 2000 minus P minus 0.25 P plus 450. And then the second to the last line there is Q equals 2450 minus 1.25p. If we want to solve for p, we get an inverse residual demand curve of p equals 1960 minus 0.8q. When solving these models, it's useful to know where the residual demand curve intersects the market demand. As it turns out, that's at a quantity of 200. You can find that by setting the residual demand curve, which we just derived, equal to the demand curve. So the residual demand curve is 1960 minus 0.8Q. That equals the demand curve, which is 2000 minus Q at a quantity of 200. Again, that's just useful as we'll see in a moment. We actually go to draw out the figure for what all this looks like. So here's a picture of the demand and the marginal revenue for the dominant firm. Of course, the dominant firm faces a residual demand curve which lies below the market demand curve out to a quantity of 200. Once you get past a quantity of 200, the market demand curve and the residual demand curve are one and the same. I'm also showing you the marginal revenue curve, which as we know, lies below the demand curve. And you see that there are two segments with a break at a quantity of 200. So now let's focus on the dominant firm's marginal revenue. So if we look at quantities of less than 200 units, the slope of the marginal revenue curve is double the slope of a demand curve. So here, the marginal revenue that corresponds with that residual demand curve is 1960 minus 1.6Q. As we'll see here in a second, it's useful to actually calculate what the marginal revenue would be at a quantity of 200. So if you plug it into this formula, it's 1960 minus 1.6Q, which we replace with uh, 200. So we know the marginal revenue of producing 200 units is 1640. Now, of course, if the quantity is greater than 200, the dominant firm's residual demand curve is the market demand curve, which is given by P equals 2000 minus Q. 
So for this segment of the dominant firm's demand curve, the marginal revenue is given by 2,000 minus 2Q. Once again, the slope of the marginal revenue is double the slope of the demand. So we'll also calculate the marginal revenue at a quantity of 200. Again, we'll, we'll see in a moment why this is useful. And that is 2,000 minus 2Q, where Q is 200 units. So the marginal revenue here is 1,600. So now we can update the figure that we were looking at a moment ago. We st we're still showing the dominant firm's residual demand curve and marginal revenue. All we've done now is we've actually inserted the values for those two parts of the marginal revenue curve. So you'll see that using that first segment of the marginal revenue curve, if you're producing a quantity of 200, you've got the marginal revenue of 1640. Over the second part of the marginal revenue curve, as we just derived a minute ago, the marginal revenue at a quantity of 200 is 1600. So again, we calculated these two values just to give you an idea of where the break is in the marginal revenue curve. Now let's look at the behavior of the dominant firm. Of course, the dominant firm wants to maximize profits by operating where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. If marginal cost equals marginal revenue at a quantity of more than 200, this means that the price would be less than 1800 and fringe firms don't want to operate. So let's say, for example, that marginal cost is equal to 1000 If you set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, you have a quantity of 500 units. And to sell 500 units, the price is $1,500. Now, I should note that this figure here is not drawn to scale. If you look at where the marginal cost intersects the marginal revenue, and if you go up on the demand curve, if you go across here, the value is higher than 1500 The reason this isn't drawn to scale is if I wanted to draw this figure to exact scale, I'd have to make all these numbers really, really small. And certainly this video would be hard to watch on a, on a smaller device like a, like a phone or something. So um, this figure and some other figures you're going to see in these videos are not always drawn to exact scale, but it's just in order to make the, the, the font large enough so that we can see what's going on. So after the dominant firm made its decision to maximize profits and operate where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, which was a quantity of 500 units and, and sell at a price of 1500 we can now look at what happens with the fringe firms. And at a price of 1500 the fringe firms don't want to operate. So if you look at the supply curve here, the cost of the fringe firms trying to supply the good actually exceeds $1,500, so they don't want to produce any units. But now let's look and see what happens if the dominant firm's costs are higher. So here we'll say if marginal cost equals marginal revenue at a quantity of 200 or less, that gives you a price greater than $1,800. And in this case, the fringe firms operate. So we'll show, for example, if the dominant firm has a constant marginal cost of $1,900, and they're going to maximize profits by operating where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And at a constant marginal cost of 1900 that quantity is 37 and a half units. If the dominant firm wants to sell 37 and a half units, it will charge a price of 1930, 1930. So now we can look and see how the fringe firms will respond. At a price of 1930 the fringe firms want to operate. And if you look at the supply curve for the fringe firms, you see that they will supply a quantity of 32 and a half units. So to sort of summarize what we just saw, if the dominant firm operates at high cost, then the fringe firms want to operate. So for example, we looked at a marginal cost of 1900. We'll call those high costs. The dominant firm sells 37 and a half units at a price of 1930. And at a price of 1930 the fringe supplies 32 and a half units. This means that the total market demand at a price of 1930 is 70 units. And 37 and a half of that is produced by the dominant firm. And the rest, or 32 and a half units, is supplied by the fringe. Now the example we looked at first was if the dominant firm has low costs. In the example we looked at, we said, hey, what happens if the dominant firm operates at a marginal cost of $1,000? In that case, the dominant firm sells 500 units at a price of 1500 At a price of 1500 the fringe firms don't want to operate. So the market demand at a price of 1500 
is 500 units and all of that is provided by the dominant firm.